Hi everybody, um, so this video is going to be quite a basic one. We're going to be getting into some real nitty gritty details of good software engineering practices when it comes to game development. But for those of you who are new to Unity and new to game development in general, this will really kind of like bring you up to speed. So what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at how I would design a game object or a game entity in a game. So even if you know, even if you do know some Unity, there might be some stuff you could learn here. Um, from my kind of design process of deciding when I'm going to design a component versus not. Um, so let's just get into it. So I've um, what I've got here. So what we're going to be doing is designing a rocket. Is we're going to make a rocket that launches and flies upwards and behaves like a rocket. Um, and this is a mesh I got from the asset store. It's free. You can see it here. Um, so just search for atom rocket model. Seems quite nice. Um, so. So yeah, so all I've done is this is just a, a new project and I've imported this asset and I've dragged the asset into the scene. So before I start designing a new a new entity or a new thing in a game, I need to think about like, what is it that we want this thing to do? Um, so how do we want this rocket to behave? And a rocket, the way a rocket works, it has constant thrust in the direction it's facing. So we want a thrust that's going to be going upwards here and um, pointing towards the front. We want the mass of this thing to decrease as the fuel runs out. And then when the fuel runs out, we want the thrust to stop and the whole thing to fall to the floor. And so like we need to think what we need to add to this rocket to make it behave like that. Now, the first thing we're going to want to add is we're going to want to add a um, something, a component that tells Unity that this thing has physics. Um, and that is the rigid body. So what we're going to do is I'm just clicking on it in the inspector. Um, and I'm going to type rigid body. It's 3D, so I'm going to pick the first one. And there we go. So we've got um, this thing now has a rigid body attached. Um, I'm going to make the camera so it's kind of wherever the camera is. I'm pushed F to focus. Oh, my gizmos are turned off. That's why. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show the. So uh, try and move this so we can actually see the rocket a bit better. There we go, that'll do. The light's in a bit of a, a weird place, but it's fine. Now, so I've added this, I've added the physics. If I click play, run the game, um, it'll just fall because we've just basically told it this thing exists in the physics engine and then the physics engine is modeling it. And because there's gravity and mass, it falls down. Now, the other stuff we want to do, which is like adding thrust and, and a mass that changes and things like that, that isn't stuff that there is a, a component already existing in Unity that will do that. So we need to create our own component. Um, and so we need to create a mono behave. So what I tend to do is um, this, your Unity might look a bit different to this. It's fine. This is just how I have mine set up. Is I'm going to create a new folder for all my scripts. Call it scripts. Um, and then I'm going to create a folder as well called behaviors because what you'll find is when you get start working on bigger projects that you'll have some scripts that are to define behaviors and some scripts that are like just data and some you don't not everything is going to be a mono behavior or be something that's to do with a behavior so then i just right click here and then create c sharp script and it unity creates one for me and i'm going to call this um rocket engine behavior notice i didn't call it rocket behavior because i'm thinking specifically this is going to be um the behavior of the rocket engine let's move this way you can see it yep cool so right so what unity has done is that it's created a a mono behavior for us so a a class called rocket engine behavior which i named the file and this class inherits uh, the mono behavior subclass and every component that we want to attach to a game object needs to derive from this class and then when we do that that mean what that means is is that we'll be able to um we'll be able to attach this script so i can do it now i can drag this script onto our rocket and then it's added there. You wouldn't be able to do that if this didn't have the mono behavior 
in it. That's what en enables that, um, enables you to do that. So what Unity has done is it's it's added two functions here for us, or two methods. These methods are part of the mono behavior subclass, and they are um, methods that are called on the mono behavior by the Unity engine. So I would highly recommend, and if you're doing my course at Swansea Uni, we will be talking about this. But I and I, maybe I'll, I can do a video on it if you want me to. Um, make sure you understand how Unity works um, with respect to all the game objects. So the engine, the Unity engine, will look at all the game objects in the scene, and it will go around them, and it will run certain methods on this mono behavior. And where you're implementing your own behavior here, you have to tell it, you have to write an implementation of what it will do. So it tells you here, like, update is called once per frame. So anything we want to happen every frame, and what that means is every time the screen renders, so that that would be a frame. So whenever you, if you're thinking like 120 frames a second, you know, you, each one of those frames is one frame. Um, so anything that we want to happen every frame, we add to this method. And then we have a start method, which is called before the first frame update. It tells us there. Now, one mistake a lot of people make when they first start working with Unity is because Unity kind of gives you these two methods, people assume you always need them, and you really don't. And what I always do when I create a new behavior is I get rid of them because I don't know that I'm going to need to use them um, at all. So let's have a think of this rocket behavior. Now, I said, so let's remind ourselves what we said this was going to do. Constant thrust in the direction the rocket's facing. The mass of the rocket decreases as the fuel ru runs out, and then the thrust stops as soon as the fuel has run out. So the first thing we need, we think about what, I start by thinking what data do we need this component to have. Some people like to start by thinking of behaviors first, and then adding those that data afterwards, and that's absolutely fine. If you work that way, that's great. Um, so I'm going to start by, so the first thing I can think of is it's going to need thrust. Um, so I'm going to add a thrust component here. Um, so thrust. So you'll notice that what I've done here is I've used serialized field. And so what we could do, we, we want this thrust thing here. This thrust value, if I save it, <clears throat> you can see that we can see it in the editor. And that's what we want, is we want to be able to edit this number, this value, in the Unity editor. And I could, I could have written, and you'll see a lot of people do this. I could write th um, public float thrust, and that will appear in the Unity editor as well. Now, the problem with doing that is that this isn't necessarily good practice in terms of encapsulation. So encapsulation is about when we we make a deliberate decision on whether or not a variable is um, accessible by something else. So if if we write public here, what we're saying is, is that we're saying that we expect other classes to be able to change this value. So we if if another class were to get access to a rocket engine, a specific rocket engine, it would be able to change thrust value. And actually, we don't want that because we want the initial thrust to be set and we want the thrust, we don't want the thrust to change. We we, we only want this rocket engine to be in control of that thrust. Um, so what we want to do is we want this to be private um, because if we didn't have that, this thrust somewhere else in our code, someone who's not you, maybe you're working in a team, they might see that the thrust value is public and they, maybe they, 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 you decide to have some kind of upgrade that increases the thrust of your rocket. I don't know, you, you know you're making some game and you, you pick up an up, upgrade and that increases the thrust of the rocket for a short time. They might um, write in their code, oh, they might see, okay, the rocket engine thrust is public, so I'm just going to grab the rocket engine behavior and change the thrust from my upgrade code. 
you might never talk to that person or, or like they might just make that change, put it into the code. And for all you know, that could introduce some weird bug. You might be doing something with a thrust in this class that relies on the fact that only this class can change this value. So it's important that we make things private as much as possible to stop that happening and trying to encapsulate everything within its class. And that's what that means. So a lot of people, like I said, they, they will set this as public because they think that's the way of getting it into the editor. So if I just leave this as private, you can see I can't see that in the editor now. So the first thing, like most Unity tutorials will, will tell you to make that public. But what we can do is we can write serialize field here. And what that does, it tells the engine to serialize this field and allow us to edit it in the editor. And so that's like, much much better practice um we could also you, you can also do things like we've set this to private but in c sharp we can actually make it so that um we can do setters and getters here so public get so by doing that um i don't know i'm still around i always get i always make the mistake this mistake um private we can also do this. So here, what we've done, I'm going to change this to capital because it's public, is that I've made this a public float. So any class outside of rocket engine behavior can get this value, but I've set it to private set. So no class outside of the rocket engine behavior can actually set this, um, this variable. So it's kind of like there's almost like two ways to solve that problem. Um, sometimes, like I sometimes do this, I sometimes do the other one. I per I personally prefer, when possible, to use this private. Just make it private because um, sometimes it can be a bit confusing. I mean, it's personal preference in a way. Like, is that you see a public um, float and you expect to be able to change it, and then you try and do that, and it says, "Well, no, you can't do that because there's a private setter." Um, I, I don't know, I find that a little bit less obvious, whereas if it's private, I know straight away I'm not meant to uh, set that. So yeah, so this is the kind of thing, I know that was like a long aside on like how to name this variable, but that's these videos are about that. They're about you thinking about that stuff, the design of your software. That's what, we're trying, what I'm trying to do here. It's a little bit different to other tutorials um, and why you're doing this course, if you're doing the course at Swansea. So, um so thrust i've got i'm also going to want um the mass of the rocket when there's no fuel because when the fuel runs out the the mass isn't going to go to zero is it it's going to be like whatever the mass of the actual rocket is so i do private float and i'm going to call this mass no fuel um and then i want to know the initial mass mass the initial initial mass so private float um, initial mass. So this is the mass of the rocket and its fuel. And then I want something to control how long it burns for. So I'm I'm going to say like float, I'm going to say burn time. So that's how long in seconds this rocket is going to fire for. Um, and then like I can go into the editor and I can change these things. So I'm going to set the thrust so I know gravity is like uh, minus 10. So the, the force of gravity is like 10. So I'm going to say, let's say this is going to go at twice gravity. So I'll do 20. Um, let's say a mass with no fuel of 10 kilograms and the initial mass of 100 kilograms. And a burn time, let's say I'm going to do 20 seconds because we want to be able to watch this and see that it works. Um, so I don't want to be sat here for you know, 10 minutes. Um, okay. So we've got that data. So now we actually need to do our, do our stuff. Um, so we're going to need to actually apply this force somehow. And the way that we do that is through the rigid body component. So we need to get that component somehow we need to get a a reference to that component we need to um to control it so 
there's a, there's a bunch of ways you could do this. Um, I always recommend doing it this way for some reasons I'll explain in a moment. So I'm going to store a, a private, um, a rigid body, and I'm just going to call it RB. And this is going to be our cached reference to the rigid body of this game object. So as a kind of revision from last time, from the last video, this game object here has a bunch of components. And these components will want to communicate with each other. They each have their own responsibility. But sometimes we need things to, to we need to access the other some components from each other. We need to communicate between them. So in the awake method, I'm going to do RB equals get component uh, rigid body. So what that does is it looks at this game object and it gets a rigid body component. Um, it gets the first one if there are more than one. So if you know, there are some cases where you have more than one of one component of a particular type, be careful of that and make sure you understand how that works. Um, if you're in that situation. So I've got my rigid body there. So this now, the awake method is called when this um, game object is created. So it's the first, before anything else is done, awake is called on the game object. It's created and that awake is called. And so that's why I put this in awake because I want to save this cache, my rigid body straight away so I can just use it without thinking about it. Okay, so I've got that rigid body there. Um, also, what we should really do is we should add um, required component type uh, type of rigid body. Now, what this does, so the way we set this up, let's imagine is that this, this um, line here, if there isn't a rigid body, then this RB will be set to null. And then when we try and use it later, that will make the game crash if there wasn't a rigid body attached. And you can imagine someone forgetting, maybe you've got a, a developer who, I don't know, or you in fact, you know, several, you, know, you might, it might be months down the line, you, you decide to add this rocket engine behavior to like an AI object. What this does, this line will make sure, will automatically add a rigid body as well, because you might forget that you need a rigid body component. And this way, like, it means you, you're doing more in the editor if you set it up this way, is the editor kind of does a lot more for you. Um, so let's go then. So we've got, so, um, okay, so we've got our rigid body. What we need to do now is we need to actually, like, apply the thrust and um, burn the fuel. Um, so the first thing we'll do actually is we'll just write a very simple, um, behavior that is to apply the thrust. So I'm going to say private void apply thrust. Um, okay. And then what we can do, our rigid body has a, an add force method. And the add force method takes in a vector of the force. Um, and there's a few overrides here. You can see, um, but what we're going to do is we're going to use the first one, which is vector three force. So it's expecting a vector. So remember a force is a vector because it has a direction and it has a magnitude. And so that force is going to be our thrust. Now, so the thrust doesn't change, does it? So thrust is, is always going to be correct times. And we want a direction now. So a thrust is just a float. So it's a, it's a magnitude, but we need to times that by a vector to get the actual force. And we need to times that by a unit vector. Now, a unit vector is a vector whose magnitude is 1. So you can just multiply it by a value, and you'll have a, a new vector that is the correct length. Now, you do need to know some vector maths for game development. Um, and if you're interested, I could do a video on vector maths for game development. Just let me know. So the question is, how do we get this direction? Now, we, what we want is we want the direction to be the uh, like this direction here, the this blue, this green arrow is pointing upwards on the rocket. And what we want to happen is if this rocket rotates at all, um, let's rotate it that way, we want the 
we want the vector to always be pointing in that direction. And that's what we can use this transform component for. And every game object in Unity has a transform component. It's the one thing that everyone has. Um, and we can actually just get that by doing transform. Um, and this is actually the, the transform component straight away. Um, and then we can get up. And if we look at this up, it says it's the green axis of the transforming world space. So it's actually a, it's this vector, right? It's this unit vector. It's exactly what we want. Um, and this looks great and like this will work and it's fine, but there's some, an issue here, a performance issue. Even though we can just type transform here, it seems like this is a cached, uh, this is cached, like we've cached rigid body here, um, but it's not. So this command get component is a search. So it, this function, this method call will look for this type, um, uh, will look for a component of this type and that takes time. So we don't really want to be calling this function all the time. Certainly not every frame, which is why I've cached this initially. So I don't have to call it again. Now this transform, it turns out that when you type transform, that's actually doing this get component every, every, for every time you, you just write that. So what I do and what a lot of people do is cache the transform as well. So I can do TR equals transform. Um, and then what I've done is cached it. So I don't, I can get a reference to it straight away. TR dot up. Um, there's also some optimization here, like for if, you, if you're kind of like really trying to squeeze performance out, um, you're probably better not doing this multiplica multiplication here, but actually um, creating a vector, storing a um, storing that vector and everything. But we'll get onto that in a later video when we talk about optimization, I'm sure. Okay, so I've got this um, apply thrust function. Just to test that this works, um, I'm going to put it in the fixed update. Now the fixed update is a function that is called on every game object on the physics update um, cycle. So there are two update methods. There is the standard update that's called every frame, every time the scene is rendered. And that can change. That depends on all sorts of things that's go that are going on. Depends on what, like, because that will happen as fast as it can, pretty much. I mean, if you've got VSync on or something that's limiting the frame rate, that will change it. But pretty much, you can't predict when update happens. And so really, update should be used a lot for animations and things you want to appear smooth. Fixed update, however, happens every so many seconds. And it's like, you can set the time, but it's, you know, a fraction of a second. And um, so that's when the physics update happens, because if you don't do a physics update with a fixed time step, what can happen is that can add error. Um, and if you want me to go into more detail on that, just let me know and I can do something. I can have a chat about that. Um, that's like a whole deep dive into physics and, and calculus and it's like, it's interesting. I think it's interesting and it's good to know. It's good to understand this stuff. Um, so some people will tell you things like fixed update is where you put your physics and update is where you put everything else. That's not true. Whenever, whenever you hear someone say like this quick tip like that, usually, you know, be a bit skeptical. What is better is that you understand the difference between fixed update and update and make a decision based on your game and your situation because it will be different for everybody. And different for what you're doing um but for us this is just we're, we're applying some thrust we're doing some physics so i am going to put this in the fixed update so apply thrust and now if i run this excuse me i am hay fever pollen is really bad here right now so my my mouth and sinuses are just like fogging up in a disgusting way um so if i click play there you go, it moves and it's constantly, if I, if I focus on it, does that work? There we go. 
it is moving and it's moving forever. So we've got some of our um, some of our functionality. Now you'll notice, um, well, hopefully you noticed, is that I put this this method apply thrust thrust only has one job, which is apply thrust. So I could really easily test it. Um, I've got one thing. It does one thing. I've checked it's working. It works. This and that method is like I can be happy if a bug comes along. It's probably not in that method. It's one line. It's very easy to read. And I can test it. And and that's what you should always be thinking of doing in your code um, when you when you do stuff like this. Um, when you're writing your own behaviors, is to try and reduce the number of like make sure every method does its own thing. That's the single responsibility principle. Okay, so what else do we need to do? Um, we need to figure out what's going on with the mass. So we're going to have to do. Let's do the. Let's let's add a. Um, let's add a method called update mass. So I'm going to do private void update mass, and I'm going to give this a float dt. DT and what 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 I'm saying here is, I want to update the mass over this time period DT. Because maybe like depending. So remember how I said fixed update? You've got two update methods in Unity: fixed update, and update. Those methods happen over a different time period, and you can get the time. You can get um, a variable. So if I do time. My fixed update, I could go time dot delta time. This is the time in seconds since, or delta time is the time in seconds since the last frame, which changes depending on the frame rate. But I've also got time fixed delta time, which is the time between each fixed update. And depending on which update method I'm using, that changes that time period between those calls. So if I decide at some point to change my code and move update mass from fixed update to update, I'll have to remember that if if I, I could I could write this update mass method like this. I could write get rid of this and I could say um do a load of code, loads of code and like time plus equals oh that's a bad one t like t not very good at x. I keep picking things that have autocomplete. So I could do lots of code and I could do something like x plus equals time dot delta or oh, fixed time. Um, is it fixed time? Fixed delta time. Okay. Let's say I do that. And then later on, I change this and move this to um, the normal update. Then I need to remember to come in and manually change this fixed out of time. Whereas what I prefer to do is to have a float DT here, but then I can pass whatever the time period is that I want to update the mass over. And that's what this is here for. Okay. So again, remember like, um, you know, I, I want to get feedback on these videos and stuff, but what I'm trying to do here is go into the detail about how I implement things and the thought process, which means kind of getting into weeds a bit. Um, but I hope that some of you find that useful. I think it's much more useful to, to understand this thought process that I'm going through than it is just to me to show you a bunch of code and you copy and paste it and use it and not really understand it. Um, so that's what this is all about. Um, okay, so updating mass. Um, what am I going to need here? So I'm going to need to change the mass. So, um, so I'm going to need. This is one of those situations where I need a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to say current mass, which doesn't exist yet. Uh, minus minus equals um, mass burn rate times dt. Okay. So that will take the current mass and take off my burn rate times how much time has gone by. So these two, you can see I've got red, red squiggly because they don't exist. Um, luckily, um, 
like Visual Studio is clever enough to realize these are both floats. So I can just click create field and it creates them for me. So I need to actually calculate these. And that's something I'm going to do in the start method. So the start method is a method that's called after awake, but before the first update for this uh, game object. So let's have a think what we need to do. So we need to find out the current mass. Well, current mass, so at the start, the current mass is going to be um, equals initial mass. Okay. And the, uh, so current mass, now we need the burn rate. So the mass burn rate is going to be the initial mass minus the mass no fuel. So this is basically the mass of the fuel, right? Because the initial mass is everything all together and the mass with no fuel is just the rocket itself. So this gives us just the fuel divided by the burn time, which is in seconds. So that's it. So the mass, what will happen is oh, if, if, the, if this DT was equal to burn time, then we would have current mass minus equals mass burn rate times burn time. That would cancel out with this. So then we'd have current mass minus equals initial mass minus mass no fuel, which would then get us to our mass no fuel. Um, so that makes sense. That will work. That's fine. So I could add, I can just add my update mass here, right? So set mass, um, and then this is going to be time.fixed our time uh, but what i haven't done is i haven't updated the mass of the rigid body so let's we need to do that um that sh i think that should be in the same in the same function here as update mass i would expect to be able to like just call update mass and everything been taken care of um so i'm gonna say rigid body dot mass equals um, and then i'm gonna do a math maximum current mass um, mass no fuel okay so what that means is, is i'm saying here that the the mass is always the mac whichever one of these is higher so if the current mass goes below the mass with no fuel i know it shouldn't be um this it shouldn't be set like that okay it shouldn't we shouldn't um the the smallest now mat the mass of this rigid body can be is the mass with no fuel. We could also add um, another ch another thing here where we could type um, if current mass less than or equal to mass no fuel, then return. So what that would do is that means that if the current mass is less than mass no fuel, we don't need to update the mass because we're done. There's no you know, there's no more burning of fuel. Um, and I like to, I tend to like to put in a lot of these checks to make sure that like, it's, it's like a sanity check in a way, like n then I am a hundred percent sure that this mass cannot get lower than the mass no fuel. So, okay. So I'm updating the mass and applying the thrust. Let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to, oh no. Okay. There's, there's something wrong because we haven't set the mass of the rigid body. To begin with so i need to set rb dot mass equals initial mass okay so now let's have a look at here i'm going to click play and we'll see the mass here okay you can see the mass is going down also notice that the, the it actually is falling um so we need to Add more thrust. Let's add more thrust. I'm going to do times ten, because um, obviously the mass is now. So like the because we're starting the mass is a hundred. We need, uh, we need a thrust of ten times that to get any lift. So let's go to let's do two thousand. Okay, there we go. So you can see now it's. You know, we, we, we have we have liftoff. Um, it's going to just fly off there forever. 
um, and the mass is decreasing as we expected. Now, the last thing we need to do is we need to turn the thrust off when there's no fuel left. Um, so we need to, um, we basically need to update our thrust. So we, we, we can have a private void update thrust. So I don't need a DT here because I'm all I'm going to be doing is checking to see if um, basically if the current mass is less than less than or equal mass no fuel then there's no fuel so thrust equals zero and then I can just put this after we update the ma mass because we want to update the mass first then set the thrust to whatever it should be then apply the thrust I what I might do actually is I'm going to what I I'm going to add a float current thrust I don't really want to I don't think I want to change this thrust value because what if we add something that allows you to refuel if we were to have a, something that lets you refuel we'd want to know what the original thrust was right so um Let's do current thrust equals thrust. Um, yeah, I picked the wrong word. Lots of THs, which I struggle with at the best of times, but not when my hay fever is really bad. Um, so current thrust is thrust. Let's set it to zero if this condition happens. And then we need to make sure we're using our thrust here. Um, so I'm going to set the burn time to like 10 seconds, just so that this can quicker. And I'm going to run. I'm going to watch that go off. Still going up, 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 still going up. Mass is going, mass has stopped going down. And is it slowing down? Okay, so I, I can show you something actually that's really nice. Like, if I go to this inspector window, click debug, then I can actually see all of the, all of these private variables that we have here that we created, and you can check that they're correct, and you can see now that it's starting to come down. <clears throat> the current thrust is zero. One thing actually we can see here. Ah, so this is interesting. So we've, we've got a little bug here, right? Because the current mass... Oh, no, it's okay. So this is this is why it was important I added that um, sanity check, because the current mass is actually set um, to... is less than 10, right? It's 9.9998, and that isn't correct. And you might think, oh, that's not far off, and... Yeah, okay, but these errors actually tend to add up. These tiny little errors, if you've got them in too much of your code, if you're playing a game for like 20 hours, that error might add up over time and become quite serious. But because we added this line here, we added this max check, then the actual rigid body mass is fine. Um, and you can see it's starting to go down now, wherever it is. Probably like, you know, minus 4000 um yeah so so yeah so that's that's how i go about creating um a behavior in a game um and it's a simple one simple rocket one um what we will be going on to next time i know it's probably a bit of a so you know so so thanks for watching and let me know what you think of this style um Probably as I go forward, the, the next thing I'm going to do is look at um, prefabs and then how we can turn this into a prefab and do things like keep track of how many rockets we have in the scene um, and start thinking about spawning them and, and other things. And even though these things are quite basic, what I'm showing you, what I'm trying to do is kind of tease out these kind of software engineering ideas um, and, and how to really design this so that you save yourself time later on because what I just did I'm sure we could have done much easier like much quicker I could have you know made like a 10 minute video showing you this 
But what I've done here, I think this component, I'm sure it can be improved and refactored somehow. But this is something that's easy to test, easy to extend to other things. And I've added in little checks that make sure that I'm avoiding bugs before they appear. Um, so hopefully that was useful. I'd love to hear what you think. Um, and let me know if you have any ideas for different videos I can do. Thanks.